Okay, so this is, uh, as always, Sunday mornings, this class entitled um, Grace in the Book of Romans. We're studying the theme of grace as Paul writes about it in uh, his letter to the Roman church. The uh, uh, lesson number, lesson number seven in the series, we'll be uh, studying from uh, Romans chapter five, actually. That's where we're at, verses one to 11. And the title of this particular lesson is The Response of Grace, and this is part four. We've been you know, doing the response of grace for several, several lessons. Um, so, so far, what we know is that after setting forth the basis of the gospel message, after Paul has done that, um, and the gospel message being uh, a man is considered worthy of eternal life based on his faith in Jesus and not in how perfectly he obeys the law. That's, that's been his argument. Salvation is by a system of faith and not a system of law keeping. He goes on to respond to four questions that his readers may have based on what he has just taught them. So he's kind of talking to himself in a sense, but you know, he, he puts forth the gospel, he puts forth his, his, his message, and then he answers questions that he thinks his readers may have you know, based on what he's taught so far. So question number one would be, what about the law? Does the gospel message void the law? Meaning it makes the, the law not useful anymore. And his answer is salvation by faith demonstrates the nature and the purpose of the law, which is to reveal sinfulness and the condemnation that results from sinfulness. That's why the law was given. Now he says, this revelation should bring man to search for mercy and forgiveness, which is ultimately found in the gospel. So the law reveals sin and condemnation. And once that is revealed in an individual, that individual naturally will search for a solution. If I'm a sinner, if I'm condemned, how can, quote, I be saved? And in that search, he finds the gospel, the good news. So as far as the gospel is concerned, this is the purpose of the law. It's not its only purpose, but it's its ultimate purpose. So that's question number one that he answers. Question number two, what about Abraham? He didn't have the law, what about him? And the answer to that question is, Abraham was considered righteous, meaning acceptable before God, because he continued to believe that God would fulfill his promises to him, even when it seemed hopeless. So Abraham, Abraham didn't obey God perfectly in what he was given to do. He was a sinner. Abraham was not righteous because he was perfectly obedient to God. He was righteous because he continued to believe God despite his failures. So those whose faith is like Abraham, Paul argues, are righteous even if their lives are imperfect. That's, that's, the, you know, that's the good news part of the gospel. So today we're going to look at the third question and answer given in chapter five. And then you know, next week we'll move on to question number four in chapter six and seven. So the third question is, what, do, what does salvation do for me? You know, what's in it for me? So until this point, Paul has talked about why salvation was necessary. And the answer to that is, well, sin is universal. That's why you know, salvation is necessary for everybody because everybody's a condemned sinner. He's answered the question how it was accomplished. Well, salvation accomplished through the atonement of Christ. Jesus paid the sins for all men. And what basis upon which it is received? Well, it's received on the basis of faith and not perfect compliance to rules. So in chapter five, he's going to answer the question that I just mentioned. What does this salvation give me? After all, before Christ, we had the law, we had the prophets, we had the temple, we were God's chosen people, you know, the Jews. For Gentiles before Christ, they felt that they were free to do whatever they wanted. They were a law unto themselves. So where's the benefit of salvation through Jesus? So Paul explains by enumerating the six blessings that come with salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So in essence, he says, here's what you get when you're saved 
by faith in Jesus Christ because of the grace of God. First thing you get is peace with God. Chapter five, verses one and two, he says, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. So we have peace with God, a clear conscience, freedom from fear and guilt and shame. A saved person can talk to God without fear, without feeling guilty, without being ashamed. So that's one thing we get that Paul says because of our salvation. We have peace with God. Another thing that we receive, he says, is joy. Verse two, he says, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character and proven character, hope. So a joy based on the hope that Christians will ultimately triumph over suffering and death. That's what you get because of your salvation. You know, the trials of everyday life serve to strengthen a Christian's character, not destroy it. That's the difference. You know, people are always asking the question, why is there suffering? Why is there so much suffering? You know, why do Christians suffer? And the answer is everybody suffers. You know, where have you been in your life? Everybody suffers. We, we, could, we could sit down here and start with Ruth there and then go over to uh, DW and then just keep moving on to Chuck and others you know, and, and interview them and, and ask them about the suffering in their life. And I guarantee you that every single person, if we finish the interview in just this room, every single person could fill a sheet with the things that they have suffered in their life, some more than others, but no one, no one, no one has gone through life without some kind of loss or suffering or pain or disappointment or discouragement or failure. So it's, Paul is saying, you know, get a clue, everybody suffers. The difference is for Christians, the suffering doesn't destroy them. The suffering simply works in such a way as to strengthen their hope. What seems hopeless for the unbeliever is only a temporary reversal for the one who has the promise of eternal life. That's the difference. If you're suffering and all you have is this life, well, you know, that suffering is using up your precious short time on this earth. You know, I'm sick for three years. Well, there's three wasted years. I got, you know, I'm only going to live you know, 90, let's say. Well, I just wasted three of them with this cancer or I've just wasted 10 of them in this bad marriage. You know what I'm saying? I only got 80 left or 70 left. But if, if, if you're going to live eternally, you have a whole different perspective on suffering and you have a whole different perspective on joy as well. And that type of experience that type of view creates this perseverance he talks about. Perseverance, another way to say perseverance, proven experience. Proven experience. Proven experience creates hope. Why? Well, we see over and over again how God sustains us in different ways through various difficulties. And this experience builds confidence there's the hope. Confidence that this pattern of God's help will continue. And that type of confidence shows in a person's character. Those of you who've been Christians you know, for a good part of your life, go back over the suffering, but then go back over the experience. Has the Lord ever abandoned you in that? And how is it that you're here today, still faithful, still hopeful, still able to experience a measure of joy and hope and anticipation of you know, the gift that God has given us through Christ? How does that happen? Well, that happens you know, because we have something eternal to look forward to. So this hopeful view of life is only possible for the faithful believer, the person who has all the money in the world, but only for this world, I mean, you know, 
they know that it's going to end and when, it's end, when it ends for them, it's over, period. So you know, enjoy yourself now because now is all you've got. But if you're not enjoying yourself now and now is all you've got, boy, you're in a bad place. <laughs> at least if you're rich and happy and healthy, you know, at least, well, you know, I got something going. But if you're suffering now and don't have the hope of heaven, woe to you. So joy. Joy ultimately is what we have through the gospel of Christ. Number three, he says, uh, sorry, here we go. Three, love. Verse five, he says, and hope, this hope that I just explained, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You know, being saved uh, doesn't suddenly enable you to be more loving and kind. This comes with practice. This comes with maturity. No, being saved brings us the, re the realization that God loves us. Never mind, you know, you're saved and you ought to be this wonderful loving person right away that forgives 70 times seven and turns the other cheek and you know, does good to the poor and you know, that takes time to cultivate that type of character. No, the first lesson that is difficult to learn even after you're baptized is that God actually loves you. For some people that takes so long, almost a lifetime to learn that God actually loves us. You know, those who are justified become conscious of God's love toward them. How? Well, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, Paul says here, there's the gift. And how does that work? Well, in Romans chapter eight, he says that through the spirit within us, our prayer life becomes much more dynamic and insightful. In Acts 9.31, he talks about the comfort that the spirit was bringing to the church, to Paul. So comfort during times of trial. For unbelievers, comfort comes through a sense of perhaps stoicism or acceptance of the situation or perhaps a resignation to the inevitable. You know, if you have no faith, that's the best you can hope for you know, when you're going through you know, the grieving process. You ever notice the grieving process, you know, the one talked about by psychologists and so on and so forth, all, the end goal is acceptance. You ever notice that? It's acceptance. You accept the new situation, whatever it is. I am now a widower. You know, my wife has passed away. I've gone through the anger and I've gone through the, you know, uh, all the state, the grief and uh, you know, the denial, the bargain. I've gone through all those stages over and over. And I finally, where do I land? Acceptance. That's the best you can do. I finally accept that my life is different now. My wife has passed and the life that we had together, that's no longer there. I have a new life. It may be better, it may be worse. I don't know, it's just new. And I accept that. I mean, that's the best you can do if you're a non-believer. But if you're a believer, you can get further than acceptance. You get to peace. <laughs> you get to peace. You're able to make peace with God and peace with others because of the sufferings that you've gone through. And how do we get to that peace? Not through some psychological you know, process that God in His mercy has hardwired into us to at least help us, you know, even if you don't believe, help us manage our you know, disasters. But through the Spirit of God, we arrive at peace with God. He's the one that ushers us into that place where we can find peace with God. So for Christians, it's a conscious comfort and a conscious hope in Christ produced by the presence of the Spirit within us. And we also have motivation, the desire to love others and to do good. But who do you think prompts that in you? That's the Spirit of God that prompts that. You know, somebody who's not nice to me or treats me badly, the response of my flesh is revenge. <laughs> it just is. You're not nice to me and you double cross me? Well, the impulse is, it may take a while, 
But trust me, you're going to get paid back in spades and you won't see it coming. That's, that's my natural, you know, so be careful, Corey. All right. That's my natural response. But the response that says, perhaps I shouldn't say anything. Perhaps I should just absorb this insult or this offense. Lord, help me not to strike back in anger. Lord, help me even to pray for this individual. And who, who, <laughs> who is prompting that in you? It's not your flesh. There's the Spirit of God prompting those type of things inside of you. So we have that kind of motivation. So in these and many other ways, we experience the love of God working in us, blessing us and blessing others. That's something we receive because of our salvation in Jesus. Another thing he talks about, assurance and security. Verses six to 10, I'll read in a minute here. Christ's death pays for all of our sins. If I were in a class, you know, like in a school room or something like that, this would be the point where the teacher says, all right, class, repeat after me. Christ's death pays for all of our sins. You know, okay, let's repeat it again. You know, this is rote learning because this is so important. His resurrection and continued presence assures us that we will continue to be saved. Again, you know that little test we did last week, you know, how saved are you? How do you feel those six questions? If you answered yes to all those six questions, you have the faith of Abraham, but if you answered no to any one of those, there's a little bit of work going. And usually people answer no to one of those questions, why? Because there's one particular failure in their lives that they just can't seem to accept forgiveness for. And it's not God not forgiving them, it's usually themselves not forgiving themselves. And as I mentioned before, if God forgives you, then you have a right to forgive yourself. But if God hasn't forgiven you, it doesn't matter if you forgive yourself or not, you're still guilty. Very important difference there. So let's read what he says here about this assurance and security. He says, for while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So Paul here is trying to explain just how much God loves us. He says, we know how much God loved us and wanted us saved. He sent Jesus to die for us when we were at our very worst, when we hated him. When we hated him is when he sent Jesus to die for us, when we hated him. So this knowledge, he says, should build confidence in us concerning his love for us. Verse nine and 10, much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So now the point he's making is, now if, if Jesus was ready to die for us when we hated him, imagine what he's going to do for us now that we love him and we want to obey him. And now that he is risen, imagine what he can do for us. Why should you be afraid? Why should you lack confidence? Why should you doubt at any time that God will save you despite your imperfection? If he died for you while you hated him, imagine what he's going to do for you while you love him. So we have great security in the knowledge that our savior is alive and active in making sure that we remain saved. I've said before, God wants us saved probably even more than we want to be saved. Because a lot of times we're careless with our salvation. We're careless with our faith. We, you know, we're weak. So he, he, he wants us to go to heaven even more than we want to go to heaven at times. What else do we get? Remember I said six things. What else do we get? Well, another thing we get is reconciliation. Verse 11, he says, and not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Now many Bibles use the word, if you're following along in your Bible, they use the word atonement or propitiation here. It's an Old Testament word meaning to cover. And it originally referred to the cover over the Ark of the Covenant that was in the temple. But eventually, like many words, it evolved in meaning. And eventually, it not only meant the cover, but it meant the appeasement for sin. Remember I told you about the flower, you know, the flowers you bring to your wife as an example of what an appeasement is? You know, you, you're a guy, you, you, you have a, an argument with your wife before you leave to work, you say some nasty things you know, that you shouldn't have said, da, da, da. you think about it during the day, you, oh, I shouldn't have said that, that was wrong. You go by, you buy this beautiful bouquet of flowers, you bring it back to her that night when you come home and you offer the flowers as part of your, I'm sorry, sweetheart, I, I was wrong, I should not have said that, that was cruel, you know. And you offer the flowers, the flowers, that's the appeasement. That's the propitiation, okay? So in this context, it refers to the sacrifice of Jesus and the reason that it was offered. In this passage, Paul refers to kind of an exchange or a change, the atonement, the reconciliation of a very special nature. It's, a, it's the change on one party induced or caused by the action of another. Now, in the Bible, it's not man who does something to change God's attitude toward him. That's, that's the basis of pagan religion and magic. In pagan religions and in magic, there are all kinds of rituals and incantations and so on and so forth in order to change or manipulate the gods or the spirit's attitude so that they will favor us. So man offers an uh, an appeasement, a propitiation, a sacrifice, something to the gods so that the gods will treat them properly. That's paganism. In the Bible, it is God who does something to change our condition, not us. So God changed his relationship with lost man from judge to redeemer and he sent Jesus to eliminate man's sins. This action has changed man from being a guilty condemned sinner to a righteous saint. In other words, God is the one who's offended and as the person who's offended, he's the one that provides the flowers. <laughs> it's as if your wife went and bought herself the flowers and gave herself the flowers and then forgave you. I know, it's upside down, isn't it? But that's how it is, that's how it works. So this change of attitude here, called reconciliation, is a constant source of joy. When he talks about exaltation, that's joy. And it's a constant source of exaltation, not just for man, but for God, because God loves man. And so he exalts in the fact that man is saved. And man exalts in the fact that he is saved. So man will enjoy it for as long as God does. And God says that he's going to enjoy it forever. That's a great source of, of joy. And then the sixth thing he talks about, again, verses 12, is eternal life. Eternal life. So the law revealed sin and its consequences, death. The Jewish sacrificial system was built around the exposure of sin and the reminder of death on account of sin. Millions of animals were destroyed, sacrificed over centuries simply to highlight this truth. Sin causes death, okay? The gospel, however, is about life and how God offers life to those who respond with faith. So Paul deals with these kind of contrasting ideas of death and life, not by going back to Moses, who was the channel that God used to reveal the law, which exposed sin and death. Paul highlights the two realities, life and death, by going back to Adam, because he was the channel through which sin and consequently death 
originally entered the world. I mean, sin was already in the world when Moses you know, gave the law. So in order to explain the benefit of eternal life, he must first explain the source of sin and its destructive result, which is death. So he goes all the way back to the beginning. So let's read verses 12 to 14. He says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. I know we understand all the individual words, but then when we try to put it together, we're saying, what? <laughs> What's he saying? Basically, he's saying, sin entered humanity through Adam and death through sin, because ultimately all men fall victim to sin. Not because they were born guilty of sin, but because like Adam, they sinned through disobedience. Now, Paul explains that theoretically, theoretically, you cannot legally charge someone with committing an offense if there's no revealed law of some kind. The police cannot stop you and say, uh, here's a $50 ticket because you were whistling while driving. And you'll say, where's the law on whistle? You see what I'm saying? There's no law that says you can't whistle and drive at the same time. So he's saying, you know, you, you, theoretically, you can't charge somebody with a crime unless there's a law forbidding that crime, a revealed law. However, he goes on to make two other observations. One, he says, we know that there was no revealed law during the time between Adam and Moses. There were no Ten Commandments. There were no revealed law of God at that time, right? Historically, we know that. But then he says, but people died anyways. What's, what's with that? So his conclusion is that even though the law was not revealed to man clearly, like it was through the Ten Commandments, through Moses, even though the law wasn't revealed that way, its principles were still in operation. And the basic principle of the law of sin and death, which is a core spiritual law, is that if you sin, you die. So this is just like our experience of the law of gravity. We know that gravity was explained by Newton in 1678. But even without his revelation of gravity's laws, people were still subject to gravity, were they not? And they knew it and they responded to it by observation and intuition. They couldn't explain why the apple falls down and not, and not up. They couldn't explain it, but they knew if they dropped the apple from the second story window, it would go down. And they, you know what I'm saying? They dealt with that. In other words, we were subject to the law of gravity long before it was explained and revealed to us. So Paul says in the same way, people were subject to God's law and were affected by it long before it was clearly articulated and recorded by Moses. Adam was an example of this. And so were those who, even though they didn't sin as grievously as Adam did, they were subject to God's law and bore the consequences anyways. So Adam's sin was great, why? Well, it was great because he had no cumulative weakness of the flesh like we do. He had intimate knowledge of God and yet he sinned. He had great privilege and opportunity, but he sinned anyways. So his great sin brought death to him and even though subsequent men's sins are less in comparison to Adam, they still bring death. I'll give you an example. Adam, let's say Adam blew himself up with a bomb. That's how great his sin was. It was a bomb. He blew himself up with a bomb. We, we shoot ourselves with a gun, with a bullet. One type is great and dramatic and violent. The other perhaps small and less damaging, but in the end result, both people are dead. One through a bullet, one through a bomb. They both bring death. 
So in the same passage, Paul says that Adam, even in his sinfulness, was a type or a preview of Christ. Stay with me here. So he says, Adam was original in form. Well, Jesus was the only begotten. He was one of a kind. Adam was the head of the human race. Jesus, the first among the resurrected. Thirdly, Adam was the channel for sin and death because through him came sin and death. Jesus is the channel for life. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 23. So in his last few verses of this chapter, Paul will compare the significance of what came through Adam, sin and death, to what came through Moses, law and condemnation, to what eventually comes through Jesus Christ, eternal life. So verse 15 he says, but the free gift is not like the transgression, for if by the transgression of the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. So the sinfulness that came through Adam was great, yes. But he says the grace that brings forgiveness for, for those sins is even greater. And it needs to be in order to cover all sin. No matter how big the sin is, God's grace is always bigger. No matter how big and terrible your sin is or was, God's grace for you is always bigger, wider than your sin. Verse 16, I know it's a long passage. He says, the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. So the result of sin was condemnation, but Jesus brings innocence. What Christ brings is not only greater in power, but also better in quality. Christ brings justification that leads to the peace and the joy and you know, the things that I was talking about before. Sin, well, it only brings guilt and fear and death. So the experience of what Christ brings, Paul says, is superior in quality than what the law brings. All the law brings you is the knowledge that you're a sinner and you're going to be punished. That's the best it can do. Verse 17, for if by the transgression of the one death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Sin brings death, right? Christ brings supremacy over death, which is eternal life. In the end, man will reign with Christ over everything, including death. And we read about that in 2 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. All right, 18, 19, pressing on. So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. So here Paul summarizes what he has just said. Adam and sin equals condemnation and death. Christ and his atonement equals justification, righteousness and eternal life. Verse 20, he says, the law came in so that the transgression would increase. Doesn't that, that's kind of strange, isn't it? So he makes a parenthetical, this is a parenthetical statement here. He explains again why the law was originally given. Not to eliminate sin and death, but to clearly reveal and condemn it. The law is there to show without, without a single doubt that we are guilty of sin. It even it's like a magnifying glass. You know? It even magnifies so nobody can doubt for a moment that we're guilty. And that's what its purpose is. Some people fight that. They, you know, they justify, they hide, they, you know. No, he says, you can't do that. That's, that's the work of the law. Let it do, it, let it do its job. Verse 2021, he says, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more so that as sin reigned in death, 
even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the law in revealing sin and death served as an instrument to also highlight the power of God's grace revealed in the power and the person of Christ. In other words, the law shows how big your sin is, but it also demonstrates how, grace, how God's grace is large. Because if my sin's that big and God's grace covers it, then God's grace must be way more powerful and great than my sin and the law that reveals my sin. So this grace, he says, is shown to A, be wide and deep enough to cover the ugliest sin in nature or quantity. You know, I think of, uh, remember Jeffrey Dahmer? Jeffrey Dahmer, the serial killer, he killed, I think, 17 men. He was a homosexual. He'd seduce young guys in parks and bars and whatever, and bring them home, he'd, he'd have sex with them, he'd kill them. He was a cannibal. He ate parts of their bodies. They found a head in the refrigerator when he was arrested. And he had other, you know, anyways, this was a bad, sick man. And he was in jail for several years. He was convicted. And, uh, and then he had a, a Bible study. Somebody sent him a correspondence course. You know, World Bible School? Somebody sent him a World Bible School, a World Bible School correspondence course. And he took the course in prison. And he was eventually converted and by a member of the church. And this, uh, I forget which town it is, but that person was a lady. They sent people to the prison. The prison gave permission. He was baptized. And after his baptism, a little while afterwards, he was murdered in prison by other, by other prisoners. I mean, I'm looking around here and I don't think anybody here is a cannibal. And I'm, I'm relatively sure, you know, nobody here has killed, murdered 17 people. And yet, God forgave this guy? And how did he know God forgave him? He had to look at the very same scripture that you look at. He had to look at Acts 2.38 where it says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He read that and that's all he had to hang his hope on. That God's word was true to forgive. How, how wide must God's grace have been to cover Jeffrey Dahmer's sins. And of course, powerful enough to change the sentence hanging over our head from death to eternal life. One other little story about Jeffrey Dahmer, which I found very uh, touching, was uh, he was guilty. I mean, uh, you know, I think his defense was insanity or something like that. When they finally brought him into court, for his trial, I remember watching a video thing of that. <clears throat> and they bring this man, this serial killer, gruesome guy, they bring him into court and his father was there. And they allowed his father to go and his father took Jeffrey Dahmer into his arms and hugged him. Imagine your son, 17 murders, you know, this terrible stuff. And there's Jeffrey Dahmer with his head on his father's shoulder and his father holding him. I mean. That's a father's love, isn't it? That's a father's love. That image always strikes me there, you know. That's our father's love. That's just a reflection of our father's love. How confident should we be in his love? If a human father can do that for his son, imagine our eternal father, what he can do for us as sons and as daughters. So, to summarize, Paul proclaims without apology that mankind is saved by faith. And he lists the wonderful blessings that come with this salvation for all to see. One, peace with God. Two, joy with God. Three, the love of God. Four, safety with God. Five, reconciliation with God. And six, eternal life with God. And all of these things only available through faith in Jesus Christ and faithfulness in Jesus Christ. All right, there we go, Romans 5, verses one to 11. Actually, we went even a little further than that in this particular study, but we'll continue next week. Thank you for your attention.